Commissioner George Bryan, do you have a question? I see your hand is raised. One minute, one minute till air. Chris, Mr. Brian has his uh, mic, it's on now. You might wanna check with him again. Mr. Brian, do you have a question? I see you have a, your hand raised. Right, 30 seconds to air. We're going live now. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Durham Planning Commission. The members of the Durham Planning Commission have been appointed by the City Council and the County Board of Commissioners as an advisory board to the elected officials. You should know that the elected officials have the final vote on any issue before us tonight. Tonight's meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom virtual meeting platform. In this virtual meeting platform, public participants do not have any ability to talk or be seen on video by default. Speakers will be given the ability to speak at the appropriate time in the meeting. If you have pre-registered, your name will be called at the appropriate time for you to make your comments, just like in an in-person public hearing. If you called in before the meeting started and staff was able to get your information, your name will also be called to speak at the appropriate time as normal. You may also call in during the meeting tonight using the phone number listed at the bottom of your screen for those of you watching live from home. If you call in during the meeting, you will need to wait until the particular public hearing you're interested in starts. After all of the pre-registered speakers have shared their comments, I will ask if there is anyone else wishing to speak. At that point, you will need to digitally raise your hand by pressing star nine on your phone. And when recognized, state your name, address, and make your public comment. Finally, all motions are stated in the affirmative. So if a motion fails or ties, the recommendation is for denial. Thank you. May I have the roll call, please? Yes, Chair Hyman. Commissioner Alturk. Here. Commissioner Baker. Here. Commissioner Brine. Commissioner Brine. Oh, I see you, sorry. Commissioner Busby? Here. Commissioner Durkin? Here. Commissioner, uh, Chair Hyman? Present. Commissioner Johnson? Present. Commissioner Kenshin? Present. Commissioner Lowe? Commissioner McIver? Present. Commissioner Miller? Present. Commissioner Morgan. Here. Commissioner Santiago. Present. Commissioner Williams. Uh, Chair Hyman, I have not received um, any communication from Commissioner Williams that she was requesting an excused absence. Um, at this time, I'm, I'm not sure if she'll join us late or not. Thank you. The 
first item that we have on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Staff has no adjustments to the agenda, Chair Hyman and Commissioners. However, we would like to state for the record that all advertisements notif notifications were done in accordance with state and local law and affidavits for those are on file in the planning department. Thank you. Uh, we are ready to proceed to our first public hearing. Um, I'd like to have the staff- Madam Chair, Tom Miller here with a procedural question. Yes, Mr. Miller, Commissioner Miller. Do I remember correctly from our meeting on the 28th of May that under the statute that specifically uh, permits this sort of public hearing, um, a commission member who is not present um, doesn't have their vote counted and it's not counted as yes uh, as would uh, obtain under our normal procedure, is that correct? I'm going to defer that to staff because we did have that discussion. Hello, everyone. Yes, that is correct, Commissioner Miller. If a member is not present, they are not counted in the affirmative, um, and they also do not count for purposes of quorum if someone leaves early. Same thing. All right, thank you. That, that helps a lot. Let me ask one additional <laughs> question. Um, since we have not heard from Commissioner Williams, um, will we be notified, you know, if, should she join us later? Will that be uh, considered a procedural? Is that a procedural issue if she joins us later? Because we, you know, we do have commissioners who have shown up for meetings late. Um, correct. At the moment, she is absent until she arrives, and when she arrives, we'll make a note of that um, for the record. Thank you. We're ready to proceed to our first item. Um, I need the staff report for Olive Branch Road, item number A190006. Sorry, I'll start over. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I apologize. <clears throat> uh, this is Jamie Sanyak. I am with the planning department. I will be presenting uh, the staff report for 1101 Olive Branch Road. Just a, tech, a couple technical revisions to the staff report before I get started with the presentation. Um, on page five, in the third sentence in section D, the reference should be very low residential future land use designation, not low density um, residential. And um, the attachment uh, six, the header, should be corrected to refer to this case, 1101 Olive Branch Road. Uh, please advance to the first slide. The applicant, Tim Sivers with Horvath Associates is requesting a uh, rezoning and future land use map change for the site, which is located at 1101 Olive Branch Road. The site is approximately 178 acres and there is a pending annexation petition associated with this request. The applicant proposes to change the future land use designation, which is currently very low density residential to low density residential, and there is no change to the recreation and open space designation. Um, and the request also includes a change from the zoning from uh, future um, rural residential to planned development residential 2.999 with an associated development plan that allows for up to 421 single family detached and townhouse units. Next slide. This uh, slide shows the aerial map. The site is highlighted in red and it fronts on both Olive Branch Road and Virgil Road. Next slide. 
The next two slides provide um, photos depicted of the site and the surroundings. While much of the area surrounding the property um, is rural and undeveloped, there are a number of recently approved and pending development cases in close proximity to the site, directly west of Olive Branch Road, um, directly west on Olive Branch Road, 11, I'm sorry, 1001 Olive Branch Road was recently rezoned for up to 616 single family townhouse units. The area west of that was recently rezoned as PDR uh, for 2.903 and it's been approved for up to 1200 single family lots. There's a conservation subdivision currently under review for up to 108 single family lots with an associated annexation petition for 434 Olive Branch Road. There is a pending zoning map change and future land use map amendment for four, uh, I'm sorry, for 551 Olive Branch Road for, um, 90 townhouse units and a pending zoning map change and future land use map amendment for Olive Branch Reserve. That's 1607 Olive Branch Road for 350 single family detached and townhouse units. This, uh, this is a set of context map which shows um, the existing zoning on the left uh, the area is currently within the rural residential zoning district and the proposed zoning on the right highlighted in blue as planned development residential 2.999. Um, it should be noted that the property uh, just west on the opposite side of Olive Branch Road should also be in blue because um, that was recently rezoned to PDR 2.944. Um, the property is uh, located within the suburban tier and falls within the Falls Jordan District B watershed projection overlay district. Next slide. <clears throat> the future land use map uh, designation um, is currently very low density residential that's two to four dwelling units per acre. Uh, and the applicant is seeking a change to low density residential which is four or less dwelling units per acre. Next slide. Uh, this map show, this is a copy of the development plan that has been included in the packet. The side uh, highlights uh, access points, building and parking envelopes, the riparian buffers and no build areas, the tree, um, uh, tree coverage areas, uh, project boundary um, buffers, stream crossings, and the 300 foot wildlife corridor uh, buffers. The plan also identifies the density um, for the site, as well as the unit number. So the text commitments, there are a number of text commitments that have been included on the development plan. Uh, these um, include a highlight of them, restricting the units to be townhouse and single family residential units, um, dedicating additional right of way for a future bicycle lane, restricting the residential units to be not closer than 300 feet to the wildlife corridor, dedicating a 100 foot wide greenway trail easement or uh, 30 foot wide constructed trail. And then there's also a series of additional um, commitments associated with the traffic impact analysis. The staff has um, received a number of additional text commitments that have been reviewed and approved by staff and I would um, like to read those into the record. A minimum of 100 units of each type of unit shall be provided within the development. A minimum of 21% preserved tree, tree coverage is provided. Uh, this is an increase from the uh, number that was included in your packet. A minimum of 30% townhouse units shall be a single car um, garage bay or less. Transparent windows and or hardware should be included on all garage doors. All units shall include a front facing gable architectural feature. Further, 
in addition, um, in order to provide variation in home appearance, no home can be constructed with a front exterior elevation or front facade or color palette that is identical to the home on either side or directly across the street from it. A minimum of 20% open space shall be provided. A minimum of three of the, of the following items shall be provided at the time of site plan, dog park, tot lot, disc golf, play fields, pocket parks, community garden, nature trail, pool, and clubhouses. The average block length, I'm sorry, next slide. The average block length shall not be, shall not exceed uh, 700 feet. Block length shall be defined as the distance from intersection to intersection or project boundary measured along the center line of the street. Next slide. Um, I'm sorry, go back one more. Prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, provide a one-time 14,500 contribution to the Durham Public Schools. Prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, provide a one-time $20,000 contribution to the City of Durham Dedicated Housing Fund. Prior to the issuance of the 200th certificate of occupancy, provide a one-time $22,100 contribution to the Durham Dedicated Housing Fund. In addition to the graphic commitments discussed earlier, the development provides design commitments to include a variety of housing types, a variety of exterior building materials and um, architect architectural features. Next slide. The proposed zoning is not consistent with the future land use map designation of very low density, uh, a very low density residential. There's a typo on that slide, but the applicant is seeking a future land use map amendment to low density residential, which would be consistent with the rezoning request. The proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plans and policies, including all those listed on the screen, which are further uh, detailed in the staff report. Next slide. The staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. And as always, staff is available for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, I do have five individuals who have signed up to speak. All are listed as proponents. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Jamie, all five of them. So, you know, basically two minutes each. So Jamie uh, Swadler. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the commission. This is Jamie Schrader with uh, Parker Poe at 301 Fayetteville Street. Um, I, I didn't think that the time restrictions applied tonight, but in any event, um, the members are here to um, answer questions. And so I'll be kind of consolidating or yielding. They'll have the yielding time so I can do the presentation and then we can answer any questions uh, as needed. Tim may, I ask one, may I ask one question? So yes, all five of the individuals are all, all of you are all together? Uh, could you, if you could read me the names, I could confirm that. Yes, I know that Tim Shivers, Laura Good, and uh, Bohan Wong, and Jamie Davis. That's correct. Jamie Davis is a representative of Pulte Homes here with us tonight. Uh, Bohang is with DHB, our traffic consultant, and uh, Laura is with my office. Okay, I need to recognize uh, Grace Smith with our staff. Thank you, Chair Hyman. We, I believe we had one late uh, registrant, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, Willie Bracey may have registered to speak on this item. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Peterson? Uh, based off of registration, that is correct. We have them listed for this case as well. So is this another individual who is speaking for? Um, I'm not sure their position, uh, Chair Hyman. Okay. So that was Willie Bracey? Correct. Thank you. I'm sorry, Jamie, we can go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we do have a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, that we submitted and that can be brought up. Thank you. 
uh, Jamie Sunyak did a great job in explaining this request, and so I'll, I'll skip over some of the introductory slides. Uh, the next slide. Um, this, the request includes a maximum of, of 421 units mixed between uh, the single family detached and townhomes. Um, and as Jamie noted, uh, it makes significant commitments to environmental features, townhouse design, unit mix, and variation um, in, a, in an attempt to avoid uh, long monotonous blocks. It's also consistent with the residential density that is in the area. Um, we can skip this slide. I think Jamie Sunyak covered that uh, fairly well. Um, but the next slide shows the existing and proposed future land use map designations. And you can see there um, graphically the area where the open space designation uh, of that 20 acres is to remain. Uh, and the, the uh, change is only to the 158 acres. Next slide. These slides that uh, were included in the staff report show site access uh, one along Olive Branch Road to the west. Next slide. And this is along uh, site access three on Virgil Road to the east. We held a neighborhood meeting at the beginning of the process, attended by about 12 neighbors, mainly just curious about the plans and how we're handling the infrastructure. Next slide. This shows the development plan of proposed access point one um, with a solid arrow on Olive Branch Road to the west and access point three on Virgil to the east. There's six additional access points shown along the boundaries of the site and an optional second access on the Olive Branch Road. The gray areas in the center show those uh, riparian areas and the two white spaces in the center are uh, beaver ponds. And I'll talk a little bit more about that wildlife corridor in a future slide. Uh, this leaves three main pockets of land to be developed between the buffers and that's shown in the hatch dots there. Next slide. Jamie did a great job in summarizing the text commitments um, that are shown in your packet. Um, this was done mainly to promote a mix of uses um, and mix of actual product types. So in addition to the mix between the single family detached and the townhomes, we've also added that additional proffer of a minimum amount of each. And note that in the single family um, uh, detached, we're planning for traditional single family as well as patio homes to provide a different price point um, and a maintenance for buyers. Um, again, we'll, we'll focus on that wildlife corridor uh, in the next slide. So this green area shows the wildlife corridor that stretches north to south across the center of the site. And it's a 300 foot wildlife corridor, but that's from either side of the stream running there. So it's actually 600 feet in dimension. And the text commitment that Jamie mentioned was that we will not have homes uh, within that corridor. So it's a full 600 width um, of, of the wildlife corridor. That's in addition to the riparian buffers that you see uh, along those streams that was required by your UDO um, stretching to the, to the west um, and east there. Um, in addition to that wildlife corridor, we'll also be um, committing to the greenway easement. So there's a substantial amount uh, of open space, tree preservation, wildlife corridor and riparian buffer on the site. Uh, next slide, slide 10. Um, Jamie noted there will be significant traffic commitments. We do have our traffic engineer um, with us, but I've just listed them here. Um, additional turn lanes at site access one and site access three uh, and an optional uh, site access two with additional turn lanes. Um, and these are in addition to offsite uh, traffic commitments at 98 and Olive Ranch Road. Slide 11. These are the traffic improvements shown in an aerial over the site. Each green pin is an access point and the blow bubbles show the actual lineage in black and the improvements that we would add in red. So you can see the actual movements that we would be improving at each access point. Um, this has been approved in the TIA um, and, and reviewed by uh, DC. Please. But this slide shows the offsite traffic improvements that we're committing to, which includes widening 98 to provide additional lanes and installing a traffic signal at 98 in Kemp Road if warranted and approved by DOT. The vicinity map at the bottom right of the slide shows how far from the site those improvements are located. Is that all of them? I'm sorry? Uh, 
but there but the improvements were um, were noted as uh, warranted because of these areas or the direction of the traffic uh, distribution in the TIA. Next slide. Um, these are a summary of the townhouse design commitments that are already in your packet. So you can see we committed to um, architectural features for the townhomes, um, the hip gable or shed roofs, primary building materials, a minimum of one distinct, distinctive architectural feature you know, that are listed there uh, on the screen. Next slide. Uh, but following discussions with the, the planning commission members, um, before this meeting and at the neighborhood meeting throughout the site, throughout the development of the site, um, we're also able to offer a significant amount of proffers tonight. Um, I really appreciate Ms. Sinyak reading those into the record and I won't read them verbatim here, but I do think they, they, um, are, they bear repeating in terms of a theme and that we're committing to not only a mix of types, but a minimum mix of each type of product to promote diversity of housing um, offers in this area. We're exceeding the number of tree coverage that's required by your UDO. We committed to 20% 20, uh, 20 of tree coverage before your UDO was increased to that amount. And then once it was increased to 20, we've actually gone above and increased it to 21%. Um, we've included a minimum amount of 20% open space. Um, we've also added the commitment to describe what the programming of that open space will be. And that's the next bullet point with a minimum of the three uh, of the file on the items to provide uh, a variety of type of, of, of open space within the, uh, within the development. Um, and then we've also added significant commitments to promote variation in home appearance so that the homes do not appear monotonous um, and have a front facing gable architecture feature to activate the street. Next slide. Um, this is the second slide of the new proffers. There, there are quite a few of them, um, but the, the reason why these were included was to make sure that uh, the front facades would be attractive and have variation, um, that they wouldn't have uh, a series of kind of monotonous garages going down the street. And that's after discussions with the planning commission. So we really appreciate that feedback um, and have included those proffers here. Um, we've also included the uh, contribution to Durham Public Schools and the dedicated housing fund um, simply broken up into two phases. Next slide. Uh, with these significant commitments and, and the offers here, um, the future land use amendment satisfies a criteria in your UDO um, and that the uh, density is compatible with similar projects for approved or under review um, in the area, including the PDR just across the, the way to the west of um, 2.9 and the nearby projects that Ms. Suniak mentioned of uh, 616 single family homes and the 350 single family and town home mix. So it's a very similar in terms of the product, um, in terms of the density uh, that is growing in that area. It's also compatible with infrastructure capacity policies and plans for this area. Those are detailed in the appendix six, um, including the extension of water on Kemp Road and connecting the sewer to the Southeast Regional Lift Station um, when that station is complete. Um, it's also noted that um, it's compatible with the level of service um, with the traffic commitments. Um, the, I think the staff report did a nice job of noting that consistency that despite creating additional trips, uh, the level of service uh, won't suffer because of the traffic commitments we're making at the site areas and off site. And then it would not create um, adverse impacts because of the extensive design and text commitments here support an appropriate aesthetic for the houses um, and street layout. Um, these commitments, as you know, far exceed um, what your UDO requires, um, especially, especially focusing in the areas of open space programming and wildlife corridor, the architectural variations uh, that we've included, the attempts we've done uh, to break up the block, block length and avoid monotony, um, and committing to the, the tree save and open space um, at areas that have exceeded the, the UDO requirements and then we've increased again with the proffers that we're offering um, here at the table tonight. And all of these go to support um, that future land use amendment um, requirements in your UDO. Next slide, please. Um, because of these commitments and the, the level of density and mix of homes, um, the rezoning also meets UDO 3.5.10, and it's consistent with the comprehensive plan policies uh, that I just noted and Ms. Suniak referred to in Appendix 6. It's compatible with the density and uses of the nearby property, both in terms of recently approved projects and projects that are 
uh, slated to be coming online um, as that area develops um, and meets the demand for housing in Durham um, that has been uh, prevalent and continues. Um, we just covered the infrastructure is available and programmed to be sufficient to support the proposed development. And I think that's also adequately covered um, in your staff report. Next slide, please. Uh, these requests, uh, th these slides just highlight some of the comprehensive plan um, policies that uh, note that this is consistent with contiguous development, residential density is appropriate in this area, and especially for the suburban tier. Next slide. Um, and finally, uh, with the commitments to open space and the wildlife corridor, um, it's consistent with your policy on open space master plan. Um, and the transportation uh, improvement to make this consistent with your bike plan and, and um, commitments for bike paths. I think that's one, one commitment we didn't focus on, but it's important to note that we're um, offering an additional five feet of asphalt for future bike lanes on both uh, Virgil Road and Olive Branch Road. And so we've really attempted to bring this area forward with from the rural designation to a slightly higher density, consistent with what you're seeing develop in this area. Um, and appropriate for, for this area of town as more infrastructure um, comes to, to this area with the, um, with the sewer expansion. And so with these significant text commitments and uh, design commitments, both in your packet and what we're proffering here at the table, we appreciate staff's uh, review of those commitments and quick feedback and that they have uh, approved those for uh, action here tonight. And based on that consistency, we uh, would, re would request your recommendation for approval um, given the significant amount of commitments and reaction to feedback we've heard throughout the process. I'm happy to answer any questions or make the team available for uh, any technical questions as well. I want to make sure that I give um, any members of the team an opportunity to, uh, to speak. So I'm going to go down the list of all that I have here since everybody's listed as a proponent. And if, um, until I get to somebody who's ready to speak. Tim Sivers. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to just take 30 seconds and clarify one item that went available. Okay. Um, you can do that at this time. Okay. Um, can you please uh, go to slide nine? It was the slide with the um, 300 foot wildlife corridor. Uh, nine, please. So in Ms. Sunyak's um, analysis, um, I wanted to clarify this text commitment and we may need to make a simple adjustment to it. Um, the text commitment um, that's in your packet reads, residential units shall not be located within 300 foot wildlife, within the 300 foot wildlife corridor as illustrated on sheet D100. So that is referencing this green area. That is the location that the residential units shall not be located with. So I wanted to be clear that it was within the green, the green hatched area and not outside of this uh, corridor. If we need to adjust the, uh, the tax commitment with planning, we can work on that, but I just wanted to clarify that item. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laura Good. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I don't have any comments, thank you. Thank you. Bohan Wan. Mr. Bohan Wong. Chair Hyman, um, I believe they have um, disconnected from the meeting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jamie Davis. Yes, this is Jamie Davis with Pulte Homes. Uh, thank you guys for and everybody for being here tonight. Um, um, I don't have any other comments at this moment, but if I can answer any questions or anything like that, um, I'm here. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and then Willie Bracey. Good evening. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the virtual meeting as I am out of state and haven't had opportunity to sit in the meetings that they've had prior to today. Um, my question would be about buffers or protections for neighboring uh, property owners um, in terms of separating people having access to neighboring land from the development what kind of protections are there 
of buffers might there be? If anyone can answer. Thank you. Well, yeah, thank you for that comment. Um, I think Tim Sivers, our uh, engineer, might be in the best position to um, respond to that. Chair Hyman, is this the appropriate time to respond? Yes. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I was following the rules, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so um, this, uh, the adjacent um, owner here, uh, uh, Willie Bracey, is to the south, um, I believe, to the southeast. Along your property, in spe uh, specifically, there's actually a stream buffer. Um, so there'll be, there'll be a good buffer along your property. However, along all the adjacent properties, um, due to the adjacent zoning, there are um, 0.2 um, opacity 10 foot buffers. Um, uh, of course, if those, if um, at the time of site plan, um, a different grading style is, con is used, those buffers will have to be doubled to a 20 foot, but there are project boundary buffers along the entire project limits. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the reason I'm asking for my mom to, um, her property is actually um, joining, um, the, the project um, on the north. Thank you. I just realized. So you're you're speaking uh, against this particular item, or you are asking for clarification. Just asking for clarification. I I deliberately didn't indicate proponent or opponent because okay. uh, I I like I said I had not attended any of the prior uh, meetings because I am out of state. But uh, since the virtual meeting came up, it was an opportunity for me to participate. Um, so I'm not a proponent or opponent. I just had a question. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I do not have any other individuals who have signed up to speak, sure. but I'm going to check at this time to see if there are any individuals, any other individuals who would like to speak on this item. Chair sure, Hyman, this is Chris Peterson. Uh, Bohong Wong is available if he wishes to speak. I apologize if he was misnumbered. Yes. So uh, I'll yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you, Chair Hyman. Thank you, Council members. And uh, my name is Bohong Wong. I'm a traffic engineer working with BHB. We studied uh, the traffic study uh, back in uh, March 2019, went through the coordinated process was scoping and defined the traffic study area and the study parameters. We completed study in April 2019 and then updated the traffic study in October 2019. And through negotiation with the city and the NCDOT, and in my opinion, we did a sufficient traffic commitment to address our side impact. So if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, once again, I do not have any additional uh, individuals who have signed up to speak. I'm going to check one additional time to see if there are other people who would like to speak to this uh, issue. Chris, I see a telephone number. Is someone attempting to speak to us? I was trying to see if they were able. Um, if anyone calling in, if you could use star nine to raise your hand if you wish to talk. I was unmuting your phones in the chance that you wish to talk. I don't believe so. Thank you. Um, I do not have any other individuals who have signed up to speak to this issue before us. Uh, once again, the public hearing is for the Olive Branch Road, 1101 Olive Branch Road. If there are no additional individuals who have signed up to speak, I'm going to close the public hearing at this time and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. So I will start um, you know, with our commissioners to see uh, if I see any hands raised. Uh, the chair recognizes uh, Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, this 
question is uh, for the applicant, uh, Jamie, maybe. I'm just curious, if, uh, can you provide us some insight into the anticipated price points for the, um, the townhomes and the single family uh, residencies that will, uh, properties that will be part of the, the development? Thank you. Absolutely, uh, Jamie Davis here. Um, so for the townhomes, um, we are anticipating um, a 22 foot to 28 foot wide, uh, one car and or two car uh, townhome. And the base pricing um, in the probably 240 to $250,000 range with a, um, Hopefully that average sales price getting closer to that two hundred and seventy five thousand dollar point. Um, single family, which could include um, a forty foot forty foot wide product, a thirty foot wide product, or maybe a, a ranch a master down product as well. Um, so we want to really try to diversify and make sure that we're hitting um, a lot of different um, buyer potential buyers. Um, so that's going to range anywhere base pricing from. 275 all the way to about 340,000 um, with probably an average um, on the uh, single family two story in the 330s. And then the ranch homes uh, probably closer to that 360, 365 price point. Thank you. Do I have other commissioners who would like to um, at this time. Madam Chair, it's Tom Miller. I'm sorry, I can't find the, the hand raise feature tonight for some reason. Um, but I have questions when it's appropriate. The chair recognizes uh, Commissioner Miller. So uh, my first question, I think, is for Tim or for Jamie Schwedler. Uh, can you tell me how many acres the wildlife corridor is? This is Tim Sivers. Um, luckily with virtual meetings, um, give me a few minutes, I can pull it up on the computer and be able to answer that question. Okay, and uh, while we are, uh, I'll just go on, Tim, you can chime in when you get that answer. Uh, and somebody from the development team, so we're calling it a corridor. What happens on either, on the properties on either end of it, does it continue? In other words, why is it a corridor? What does it connect to? This is Tim Sivers again. While my files are opening, I'll be able to answer that. Um, the, the, the properties to the north and the south, um, you know, this, this is a corridor that is uh, part of the Durham and Open, Durham Open Space Trails Commission. Um, this is something that's in their policies. Um, uh, you know, with not having control to, of the properties to the north and to the south or outside of project limits, it's it's really hard for me to say what those projects will do um, if and when developed in the future. But uh, they're identified in our plans. That is correct. That is my understanding. Yes, sir. Thanks. That really helps. And so uh, we talked about what the significance was of those the edges of that green shaded area and that you can't build units inside it. What does happen inside it? What can you do? Will it be all natural? I'm just trying to understand what a wildlife corridor is. Yeah, no, this is Tim Sivers again. So it, um, it, it, can, be, uh, it can be disturbed. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to stay all natural as it sits today. Um, some of the, um, you know, as you've seen in the aerial images, the site was uh, forested uh, probably within the five to seven years ago. So some tree growth is coming back through. But this wildlife corridor, again, is more, more of a true wildlife corridor. It it's, will stay open space, if you will. So, you know, there's, there's different items that can be used um, within open space and that are allowed within the open space requirements or allowances, but it, it's open space. So there won't be any, there won't be any, um, there won't be any homes, there won't be any residents, any, any, you know, um, buildings like that within the space. Uh, we do have a road crossing um, and, you know, so the, the beaver ponds and everything like that, it's, it's a natural corridor is what, is what it is. And so I have some questions to help me understand uh, some some of the features. We have a 21% tree coverage, and that will include 
trees in riparian buffers and trees, I suppose, that are in this wildlife corridor. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then there's 20% planned open space. Will any of that space be reside inside the wildlife corridor? Uh, yes, sir. The wildlife corridor is inside. That is correct. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand. Did somebody bump the mic or something? Yes, it, the wildlife corridor is an open space corridor. It will remain as open space. I, just I know it's open space, but is it part of your planned open space for dog parks, et cetera? That is a possibility, yes. At this time, we haven't gotten to the real details of, of where those open space items will be. But yes, that is a possibility that it could include some of those items. So we could have overlapping commitments to space, wildlife corridor, planned open space, and tree coverage could all be three layers. Could be. That is correct, and, and that is a, an allowance in the ordinance. Um, you know, open space and tree coverage always overlap, um, and, tip, and open space and active open space or recreational open space, as it's known, also overlap. They are always, that, that is how the ordinance uh, allows it. And uh, staff may want to um, be able to clarify that as well if necessary. And, uh, and ultimately, I, I guess my, I have a question for Miss Bracy, if I may, or for this. Can somebody show us a map and tell me where Miss Bracy's land is? Point to it. Can we do that in this format? The neighboring property that she was interested in. Bring the presentation back up. I think we can do it from the development plan. Or, or staff can. I see that Jamie uh, Soniak has raised her hand. Good evening. <clears throat> the map actually has been pulled up. So my understanding is that um, uh, that the properties uh, in question or um, from the caller are just south of the subject site where That's the where the hand is on the east side um, fronting on Virgil Road. Okay, Jamie, so, I I'm sorry. I spoke with you on yesterday. So where the hand is, mm -hmm. that's Gray's property, but my mom's property is the next one where, where it says 22, whatever it is, that's my mom's property there. And my property is south of hers. It's joining hers. So it's it's yeah. the properties over there on, on the east side of that kind of dividing line that runs north from the E and the word development plan. It's in there where the hand is. Yes, that's my mom's property, and joining her there is our property. And so, uh, again, because the map is very small, and I didn't get copy of this in my uh, packet. Um, help me understand, what is the width of the riparian buffer along that stream that's shown there? Is that a 100 footer or a 50 footer? This is Tim Sivers. All the buffers are 100 foot on each side of the stream. So the it's a total of 200 foot from- That would effectively be a 200 foot buffer that is correct. Uh, for between whatever is developed on the subject site and whatever might be developed on the neighboring property. Is that right? That is correct. And I'm assuming that that little square that's kind of isolated by the stream down there, you don't show a crossing to that. So you currently do not plan to build anything in that? That is correct, sir. That area will remain natural. Okay. And did you get that acreage figure to yes, the nearest sir. five? Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm playing with the mute button here. Um, it is approximately 30 acres. 30 acres. Thank you very much. Those are my questions, Madam Chair. And But I do want to close with a comment uh, that I am uh, gratified by uh, some of the additional uh, commitments, especially the design commitments. Um, it is a much better project than when we talked about it, I guess, week before last. Uh, Thank you. I do have... Chair. Thank you. I do have uh, Commissioner Baker has raised his hand and the chair recognizes Commissioner Baker at this time. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, so I really appreciate um, the, the time that's been put into this project by uh, Jamie and Tim and, and the conversations that you all have had with me and with many of the other uh, commissioners here, um, the professionalism that you all have, have shown and the dedication that you all have, have made to uh, meaningfully address a lot of the comments that, that we've had in this process. And so I think that um, you certainly deserve um, you know, credit for, for that work that you, that you have done. And I also think that um, some of the changes that you have made um, have improved the project, um, both, uh, both improved it for, I think, the public good, um, as well as, you know, I think that you will have a better project and a better product uh, from a marketing standpoint on your end. So I just want to go over some of the, some of the good things about this, this project. Uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll be missing some. Um, the average block length commitment is um, significant. You know, we that's a hole in our unified development ordinance that we that we do not have that as a as a standard and a regulation, and and so um, that you've stepped up and provided that uh, means a lot um, and and makes the project uh, better, and it's also better for uh, sustainability. Um, the development plan shows. Um, uh, although I still don't think that it shows enough, it shows more access points uh, than we typically see. Um, that's again, you know, um, in consistent with the with the block the block length commitments that you all have made, and that's very very good. Um, the wildlife corridor that's consistent with the plan um, is good. I don't I, I don't know what other options there were, but I think that that's a, a very good commitment that you all have made. And uh, some of the ar architectural features that um, you have made as commitments that um, Commissioner Miller spoke about, um, I also think are very important, again, both from a, a public good standpoint and um, in relation to what is good for pedestrian oriented development, as well as, you know, what is a profitable development, what makes a, a development better. I also think that there are some uh, missed opportunities. Um, and so I wanna talk uh, about some of those as well. I would call this pretty much a textbook case of non-contiguous leapfrog development. Uh, and just because there are other cases surrounding this one of recently approved um, non-contiguous leapfrog development um, doesn't mean that this no longer is that. Uh, it very much is. Um, I'm still very concerned about the amount of development that we are processing that lacks street trees between the sidewalk and the curb, which is just a fundamental best practice. Um, street tree infrastructure is, uh, is absolutely essential to cities. And I find that uh, just deeply concerning that we are building the future of our city without um, this critical infrastructure. We know that there are disparities between who gets to live in neighborhoods with street trees and who doesn't get to live in neighborhoods with street trees. Uh, we know that the value, both financial value and the value um, in terms of quality of life and health are substantially increased in, in neighborhoods that have um, uh, street trees. And, and uh, th that specific location between the sidewalk and the curb is, um, it's a best practice for a reason and it's common throughout the country, uh, with the exception of Durham for, for a reason. Um, I'm also uh, disappointed that there is no commitment for uh, an appropriate connectivity ratio of 1.7 um, that would better ensure the transportation accessibility and uh, consistent with, with best practices. Um, I also think that this is a huge property. Do not forget the scale of this property, absolutely huge property. And there really are very limited housing options that are being proposed here as part of the commitments. Um, frankly, I'm disappointed with uh, commitments for only two different types of single family housing, single family being attached housing and detached housing, but, but in both cases only, only two. 
I also am disappointed in the lack of neighborhood commercial and employment uses, um, especially at this scale of development. Um, really nothing uh, intertwined in the neighborhood that people are able to, to walk to um, or access and using other means of transportation. And I'm also uh, um, disappointed with the lack of commitment to sort of ensure that buildings are fronting on to civic spaces, that, that those are, are centralized uh, spaces within within the neighborhood and that they're accessible within um, a walking distance or a biking distance so sort of a quarter mile pedestrian shed of of homes uh, and you know I'm I'm personally disappointed although I don't think that it's completely necessary but I would of course like to see um, alleys so the lack of alleys um, you know it doesn't help the application it, it doesn't uh, necessarily uh, rule out my my uh, support for an application like this. Um, and then also uh, that we have no indication that this development is, is gonna incorporate any, any elements of sustainability, uh, renewable energy, um, energy efficient materials and design, uh, other green building elements, pedestrian oriented features that would um, assist the transition over time to green and walkable and transit oriented built environment. Um, that alone is, is, is almost disqualifying for me. So um, I have to applaud some of the commitments that the development team has made. I, I can't deny that. I have to uh, applaud those commitments. Um, but to earn my support, this development proposal would need much more um, for a site of this scale. So that, those are my those are my statements. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Um, I recognize Commissioner Durkin at this time. Hi, this is Erin Durkin. Um, I just wanted to voice my opposition to this project. I think that there's a lot of development on this stretch of Durham. I'm concerned about the capacity, the roadway capacity, pedestrian safety, and vehicle safety passenger safety. I'm concerned about the development of this wetlands area. Um, I'm concerned about the overlapping counting of wetlands and open space and tree save, even if that is permitted in the UDO, it seems a little misleading to me. Um, so I'm short and sweet, but I'm going to vote no on this one. Thank you, Commissioner um, Al Turk. Thank you. Uh... Chair, uh, I just I'll make I'll try to make mine short as well. My comments. Uh, I want to echo what Commissioner Durkin just said, um, and what Commissioner Baker also said in his comments. Um, this is a property that is adjacent to one that we heard in October. If you all remember, I think it was 1001 or 1010 Olive Branch, uh, and we voted um, against that one as a commission. Um, for a number of reasons, and I won't rehash that conversation. I think that we had a very good debate that that night. Um, and but I, you know, in my mind, a lot of the same things that we did not like about that um, development kind of is, is the, still the case here. Uh, I, I agree with Commissioner Baker that the application here is stronger. Uh, it includes some element, some text commitments that we hadn't seen before in some cases. But I think overall, you know, it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still worried that we only, yeah, this is only just single family homes and townhomes. Uh, I'm starting to worry that developers will, will kind of say, well, this is a mix of housing types when I think we're looking for something more than that. Um, you know, I, this is, I would like, I would continue, you know, I, I would still like to see affordable units on site rather than just a, a commitment to the fund because I think that's important. Uh, you know, Real a real indication of connectivity, um, you know. I again, Commissioner Baker knows about this more than I do, so it, and, and he appreciates the shorter block lengths. But I, I still, I'm still not sure. Overall, you know, is this really a, a, a very well connected development? Is it going to promote uh, pedestrian uh, walkability whenever this area does get built out? You know, will people still continue to rely on cars? Uh, I think they will, unless we demand something different, something. Um, so I, 
you know, uh, and I'll just close with something else Commissioner Baker said, this is almost 200 acres. Um, you know, we can do something better, I think, with this much land. And, you know, to, to me, this sounds like relatively uh, unaffordable units, um, you know, not very dense, and it could be more dense in my mind, uh, but again, with more housing types, um, more affordability, et cetera. So I'll just, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Alturk. Um, Commissioner Santiago, followed by Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Chair Hyman. Um, again, not to rehash too much of what's been said already. Wanted to voice my opposition to this project. Um, as mentioned, I don't really think this really does much in the terms of the in terms of the affordability issue. I think that's a little bit misleading. Um, we have talked about in the past in past meetings affordable versus accessible. I don't think that in terms of pricing, this is too accessible to many families still. And terms of location it's not accessible either there's no transit out there it's very very car dependent even more so for that area and so lower income people middle income people who need a car who can afford it they won't be able to access jobs or even at housing which is right there um, as commissioner baker said i would like to see more incorporation of commercial use as well even though there's no there's no post office out there, there's no stores out there. It's very, very car dependent again. It's, there's the closest thing there is probably like two miles. So I'm just not really seeing, I'm not really seeing the support on my end on this project. That's all I wanna say. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm gonna echo the comments as well. I appreciate that there are some promising commitments. Uh, given the scale of this project, I just don't think the commitments meet the scale of this project. This is this is just a massive project. The the other uh, previous project that we saw as well, when you combine the two, I really fear that we're creating a satellite piece of Durham that is really not connected to the, the rest of our community. So um, I'd also just echo what Commissioner Durkin said and Commissioner Miller's questions uh, were questions that I had when you look at the numbers where the open space, where the wetland is that has to be protected. And then you look at the, uh, the overlapping numbers, the amount of open space and tree coverage actually isn't as, as good as it needs to be in my opinion. So uh, again, I appreciate the effort, but I, I'm a no vote as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Busby. Uh, Commissioner Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I was trying to find a mute button. Uh, my only concern is really a lot of the traffic going to the south. A lot of the a lot of the traffic study was going towards the north and the improvements being made, but going to the south is really where there's a lot of uh, traffic flow that may end up going into Wake County. So uh, I live close to that area and I know what it's like uh, going south on uh, on Leesville and um, Olive Branch and going into Wake County. So there is quite a bit of traffic there. And I'm not sure whether we're just not doing much in that area, just only because it's bordering Wake County, but there should be more study in, in the, uh, the traffic flow but going south, because I would imagine a lot of the people purchasing property there would probably be going into the into uh, Raleigh or going to the airport. Those are my comments. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do want to remind all the commission members that uh, even if we approve all of this, it's still it's still less than three units an acre. Uh, so it's a big piece of property, but it's hard to call this a massive project. Uh, it's actually kind of a small project in terms of its overall number of units. I, and I was glad though we did talk about, we got, I, we got so busy talking about other things. Um, we have a commitment for, if I'm understanding these commitments, $41,000 for affordable for the affordable housing fund and that's more money than I personally am contributing, but 
if I if my math is right, that turns out to be ninety-seven dollars and sixty cents a unit uh, for each unit that's built here. Um, and so there, and I realize there's nothing that compels uh, developers to make any contribution at all. But ninety-seven dollars and sixty cents is essentially a nice evening out for a couple that would buy one of these units and live in it. That's one shot deal. Uh, we'll get forty-one thousand dollars, and we can't build an affordable housing unit for that. Um, I agree with the other commission members. It would be great if there was some sort of commitment that would that we could put in here for uh, affordability. And I realize that it, that a, a, a direct commitment for affordability based on what's happening in the courts might be difficult to enforce. Um, but a commitment that was dimensionally limited, like saying a certain number of the units will be smaller than this dimension, uh, would be enforceable. And, and it, while it may not necessarily meet the idea of affordable affordability the way we define it it means that we will have a more mixed community and that some of the units i mean i i would love to see a project of this scale having uh, a few units that were you know two bedroom two baths that were uh, under 1300 1400 square feet um, so that there would always be some sort of entry level um, units and that we would we would sprinkle these through all new communities everywhere we build them i would love to see those things and uh, i probably should have mentioned it when we spoke to the developer when i spoke to the developer and their representatives a couple of weeks ago um because uh, i have to say that a lot of the things i did talk about that they've been very responsive to and i'm grateful for that uh, so Madam Chairman, is it, uh, may I ask, uh, uh, since we now have um, uh, the gentleman from Pulte Homes here uh, and Jamie Schwedler, would it be possible to increase the amount of money that you would make, that you would pay to the affordable housing fund so that it would be at least two nice evenings out? Is that out of the question? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is Tim Sivers, uh, uh, Commissioner Miller. So um, I do want to note a few points, and thank you for um, thank you to all the commissioners who have pro provided the comments to us, uh, and, and I appreciate um, everyone's everyone's uh, input. Um, the item I would do want to note for the um, affordable housing is um, it's a uh, you know with um, it's a maximum number of units with four four hundred twenty one, um, so it's a forty two thousand one hundred dollar donation equating to exactly hundred dollars per unit. Um, but what that what that number is based off of is. Um, the um, kind of quote unquote standard rate here that a lot of the developments have done. But the item I do want to note is um, that is approximately two times the amount of the bond referendum that was approved uh, that may, the city council and Mayor Shul put out um, for, um, for to the city that was approved by voters. Uh, roughly, I believe that bond referendum was around 50 to $55 per $250 to $300,000 home. Um, so, so that number is based off of um, a higher amount based off that bond referendum that uh, city council put forward. So that's where that calculation is based off. And that's certainly a way to look at it, and I appreciate that. But um, I'm just trying to see if I can. It, I mean, I've listened to my fellow commission members and many of the commission members on whose side I usually vote. And I was trying to see while we're sitting here if there was a way perhaps to sweeten this pot a little bit before we vote. And that seemed to me an empirical way that uh, where movement could happen uh, without having to uh, have conference with staff and getting slide rules and things out um, and having to worry about azimuths and things like that. Um, so I just threw it out there. Um, I have to say that. Uh, I have been pushing and pushing and pushing for years for so many of the things that this developer has added in the in the form of commitments, and I feel obligated to reward that with a yes vote here. But that's not to say that I am not listening to what other folks are saying. Uh, Mr. Baker sent us a paper uh, about 10 days ago, uh, which I have spent a lot of time looking at and quite frankly, Googling some things, trying to figure out what he was talking about. Um, 
and I hope there is a time when we can all talk about that outside the context of the case, because um, I would like to develop my thinking and raise the plane of our discussion uh, when new cases do come. But I think it's important to talk about the things he was he has he has listed outside the context of a case. So I'm going to vote yes on this. I'm not going to uh, argue with any commission member who votes another way. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Miller. Uh, are there other commissioners who would like to speak at this time? I do not see any additional hands raised, but I will check to see if there are other commissioners who would like to speak to this issue before I close the public hearing. Well, before I call for a vote. Madam I, Chair, this is Jamie Schwabler. I don't want to talk out of turn. I do have my hand raised to just answer a few of the questions that have been uh, raised during the discussion whenever the time is appropriate. Okay, very good. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, you, you may go ahead and speak at this time. And I do have one additional person who also has um, asked to speak as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jamie Schwabler. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, the commission was aware of, of several additional factors before uh, the vote is taken and that um, with respect to the um, street tree um, request, there was an additional commitment uh, that we offered to increase uh, trees on end units. Uh, there was a discussion with staff about how that would be implemented and it was it was determined that the commitment should not be added at this time, but it was in the um, commitments that we sent around to you to show that, that we were prepared to commit to that. Um, uh, and then the, the other comments I think about um, traffic to the south, the reason that the commitments were made um, to the north is because of our trip distribution in the TIA and, and NCDOT's observation of where uh, more of the traffic uh, would be generated from this particular uh, intersection or this particular development. And because of some of the other approved developments in the area, you might see additional improvements being made to the south. It could be by different developers, but just that this particular trip distribution was to the north. Um, and then with respect to the comments made about the changes we've made uh, since our discussions with the commission, I really appreciate you recognizing that two pages or two slides of 14 additional conditions is significant. It's based on direct feedback. Um, and as, as Commissioner Baker, you know, uh, you know, you handed us a two page uh, list of requests of 20 different requests to make um, at least five, and we did that. We responded to those requests. And um, you know, I, I can't say it's not disappointing for us having made those commitments um, to, to have you know, um, a, a, a proffer and, and things that we consider very significant uh, and still not be able to be, uh, receive the, the support of the commission. So I hope um, that, that we can move forward tonight um, I do believe that, you know, some of the discussions that are broader discussions, as Commissioner Miller mentioned, um, if there's desires of the commission to see a certain thing with every project or that UDO calculate, you know, not allow overlapping calculations and things, that the appropriate way to do that is to change your code, to change your UDO to require those things or incentivize those things in some way. Um, but I don't, uh, th those things aren't in the code today and what we've offered you is far above what is in the code. And so I hope that you will reconsider some of your votes. I hope that you'll reconsider the um, significance of the, of the commitments and why we've made the changes that we have um, and before you uh, vote tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Durkin. I just wanted to clarify that Comments or requests from one commissioner are not reflective as of the commission as a body. Um, and the request that the proffers that you made on behalf of a request from one of us is not what we are projecting as a united commission. So I want to make that clear and that those additions did not sway my opinion of this project. Um, the aesthetic kind of additions and proffers are not something that will that will move my vote on this. 
Thank you. Um, Commissioner Miller. I see a hand raised for Commissioner Miller, but if that's not. No, I lowered it. Okay. Should show lower, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and recognize, uh, there is an, let me make sure, there is an attendee who has a hand raised um, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and recognize Bohan Juan at this time. Oh, thank you, um, Madam Chairman. And uh, just want to talk about traffic. I heard um, your comments regarding traffic from several council members. Just want to talk about traffic. And we have been scoped with, uh, with the city, with the DOT to define the traffic parameters. The traffic distribution is distributed following the existing travel patterns. And as we know, NC-98 get heavy traffic and we made a significant commitment to widen, to add a second left turn on Olive Branch and add the, uh, do a second upgrade over there. And talking about the traffic going on south, uh, 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 Jimmy already mentioned that there's some other development, developments and they are doing improvements along Olive Branch Road and providing a northbound left turn line at Doc Nichols, also providing a southbound left right turn line at Carpenter Pond Road and install traffic signal. And also there's uh, some other, you know, project going on, there are some negotiation regarding additional improvements at all the study intersections. And with commitment from this project and from other background developments, and then we, our level of service analysis and our capacity that's showing all the study intersections will meet NCDOT and the city standards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will check once again with commissioners to see if there are other commissioners who have comments that they would like to make at this time. Okay, I do not see any uh, additional hands raised. So I am going to entertain a motion for this item at this time. Madam Chair, if I may make a motion, it's Tom Miller. Uh, Mr. Miller, I need to remind you that each time, um, because you're not on a, a video, that you will need to say your name, uh, Commissioner Miller. So that, yes, Commissioner Miller will be making the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in connection with case A19, quadruple zero six, I move that we send this forward in the Correct jurisdiction here is city, right? That is correct, Commissioner Miller. That we send this forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Uh, Commissioner Thank Buster. you. Thank you. Motion by Commissioner uh, Miller and second by Commissioner Busby that we send item A1900006 1101 Olive Branch Road forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor of this motion, may we have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Morgan. No. Commissioner Johnson. No. Commissioner Bryan. Commissioner Bryan. He vote? Kind of I can hear him. Okay. He flashed the sign. Okay. Commissioner Durkin? No. Commissioner Alturk? No. Vice Chair Busby? No. Chair Hyman? No. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe? Yeah. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner MacGyver? Yes. 
Okay, the motion fails nine to three. Thank you. Now the nine to four, I apologize, nine to four. Now I will entertain a motion for the zoning map changes and that's item number Z1900012. Commissioner Miller, Madam Chair. In connection yes. with case Z19 triple zero one two, I uh, move that we send this forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Thank you. Uh, motion by Commissioner Miller, second by Commissioner Busby that we send item number Z19 zero 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 one two eleven o. Uh, 1101 Olive Branch Road forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. May we have a roll call vote, please? Yes, Commissioner Morgan. No. Commissioner Johnson. No. Commissioner Brine. I cannot see Commissioner Brine. Can someone tell me if you can see him or hear him? He's holding up no. He's okay. holding up a no. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Durkin? No. Commissioner Alturk? No. Commissioner, um, excuse me, Vice Chair Busby? No. Chair Hyman? No. Commissioner Miller? Commissioner Miller? Forgive me. Yes. Okay. It's okay. I can wait a minute. I know it takes a second. Commissioner Kinchin? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe? Yes. And Commissioner McIver? Yes. Uh, same. And the motion fails nine to four. Thank you. And Madam Chair, it's Commissioner Miller for uh, Grace's benefit. Commissioner Bryan has held up a sign a couple of times indicating his vote, but written on the top of that sign, he has also indicated that he is having mic difficulties. So he is. Uh, I'm, I'm yes. trying to adjust my view so I can see him. I haven't been able to see him, but I'm going to. Um, so if I may, George, when you hold your sign up, you need to hold it higher, a little bit higher than you've been holding it. There you go. Okay, I see him. I can see it now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Okay. I saw okay. it that time. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, we're ready for the next item, uh, public uh, hearing for uh, item number A, 1900007, and this is... Um, 4115 Andrew Avenue. We're ready for the staff report. And it also is an amendment with a concurrent zoning map change as well. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Emily Struthers for the planning department. I will now be presenting case Z19-00014 and A19-00007 for 4115 Andrew Avenue. Next slide, please. The applicant, Nate Bueller with Cambridge Properties Incorporated and Robert Schunk with McAdams. The site is located at 4115 Andrew Avenue and includes three parcels totaling 20.35 acres. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from commercial general and residential suburban 20 to residential suburban multifamily with a development plan for a maximum of 115 townhouse units. This site is currently in the county, but an annexation petition has been submitted and staff would like to note that an issue has arisen regarding the sewer surface for the site and whether it will be provided by the city or the county. This will need to be resolved before the case can be acted on by city council and references within the staff report to sewer connections and the summary utility development statement may need to be modified following the resolution of that issue. Uh, the aerial map on the next slide. Uh, the site is shown in red between Andrew Avenue and US 70 near South Miami Boulevard. Site photos illustrate the vegetated nature of the site and adjacency to the water tower. Area photos depict a mix of uses in the context area, including industrial, commercial, and residential uses. The site is located in the suburban development tier, 
the portion of the site is adjacent to US 70, is currently zoned commercial general, and the remainder is zoned RS 20. The future land use map designation is currently commercial, and the applicant is seeking a change to low medium density residential for four, four to eight units. The development plan includes commitments such as access points, building and parking envelopes, and project boundary buffers, uh, further detailed in the staff report. Key committed elements include a maximum of 115 townhouse units, transit related improvements and right of way dedications, reservations and a center turn lane. The proposed zoning is not consistent with the future land use map designation of commercial, but the applicant is seeking a plum amendment to the low medium density residential, which would be consistent with the zoning request. The proposal is consistent with the comprehensive plan policies, including those listed on the slide and on the next slide and further detailed in the staff report. Staff determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances and staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Sorry, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I have two individuals who have signed up to speak. And the first is Robert Schunk. And the second is Nate Euler. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, can everyone hear me? Robert Schunk? Yes. Okay. Good evening, Madam Chair, fellow commissioners. Um, and thanks, Emily, for the report. Um, and. Uh, I won't attempt to uh, repeat everything on the on the slide. If, uh, if you could go ahead and pull up my slideshow, that'd be helpful. And it, just as a precautionary item, the internet where I'm at is uh, has been a little on the fritz. I have a I'm also on my cell phone, so if that does cut off the uh, 919 308 number, that could be plugged in. Uh, that would be helpful. Now, if you can go to the next slide, please. So, uh, so this area, um, it's in the, you know, the context area is uh, there at uh, Miami and 70. It is uh, at some point when the, the DOT has their funding back in place, that'll be going under a significant, uh, some, some significant changes. Uh, you know, we feel the site is a uh, typical infill development of 20 acres. Uh, the developer, Nate Bueller has looked at this as being a site suitable for a single housing type, as we're proposing uh, 115 uh, units max. Um, the proposed townhomes is going to be our sole uh, choice. In term, you know, when we speak about alternative uh, housing choices, there are several other uh, apartment communities in the area, uh, down Miami Boulevard, uh, Ellis Road as well. Um, we are changing the flume from commercial to low density. So really the, the question really comes down to is the, you know, the, the density range that we're, we're choosing. Uh, the site will, uh, will have direct access to Angier and we're uh, uh, making a stub to the north. Go to slide two, please. This project started about uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, the developer held uh, two neighborhood meetings the first neighborhood meeting, the developer had proposed 280 apartment units. Uh, in the first neighborhood meeting, where we we're proposing about 14 units per acre, um, the residents nearby did not feel that provided an appropriate transition from the commercial to the RS20 homes along Angier. You know, they felt that there was a, a concern with the large scale of the apartment buildings. Uh, in relationship to their homes, uh, a lot of the concerns with uh, with traffic, and also there were some other concerns as well. Um, Cambridge Properties reevaluated their approach. Uh, they reevaluated the market study they were doing. Uh, the market study showed that uh, the site was probably better suited for townhomes. Uh, when they went back to the second neighborhood meeting in August, uh, the, the reduced density the for sale type of product was uh, significantly better received. 
uh, and the density is you know just under five units an acre. Slide three, please. Um, additionally, uh, the developer worked closely with the North Carolina Department of Natural, Re Natural and Cultural Resources uh, on the site and to the west is the uh, is and was the DeWitt Bailey Tenant Farm. Um, the uh, resources did re review um, and found several ruins to be on the site and, and found that the farm and the, the structures did lack significance uh, to the agricultural property and so not saw no impact uh, on the, um, by removing those and providing this development. There are several grave sites that were uh, discovered on the site. They will be preserved in open space. Um, at the, uh, going on at the time of the site plan, there will be a, um, you know, we do have a couple of stubs, one to Bailey Street and also to Hensley Drive. At the time of the site plan, we're gonna look to remove that due to environmental conditions. And then the, the development, the, uh, the land to the south was platted Perhaps in the 1950s, it has 60 foot right away. It's going to put lots, so it's likely that that property would be, you know, developed for a different type of use. Uh, for this project, we are proposing to uh, construct uh, townhomes ranging from 1,600 to 2,200 square feet with a 22 uh, by 26 foot uh, width. The block lengths, you know, just by the nature of the site, uh, the, the the narrow width and the narrow depth. The block lengths will be very uh, will be short. Uh, we measured that the longest block length would be less than 500 feet. Next slide. Um, you know, planning department uh, finds this staff consistent with the EDO and the comp plans. Uh, the neighborhoods also found that um, you know our second proposed proposal with the townhomes uh, is very is is a, a good fit for their neighborhood. Um, we, regarding the uh, capacity, we do have uh, appropriate capacity on the nearby roads, school, water, and sewer, and any and all other critical services for this infill site. And to speak to uh, em Emily's uh, point on the uh, uncertainty of sewer, we were first sent a utility impact statement from the city saying that the city would provide all city water and sewer services. Uh, earlier this year, um, the county said that they would serve it, but we would require to put a pump station in. And then uh, about a few weeks ago, this county said that the uh, we would need to serve the county portion with uh, the, by the county and the city portion with the sewer. So we've reached out to uh, uh, senior staff in the city to uh, resolve those discrepancies uh, with um, you know some of the um, boundary line of this uh, sewer basin site. So. That will be solved one way or the other. Uh, we have no concern about that. Um, but we would, uh, in closing, we would appreciate your positive recommendation, City Council. Uh, thank you. That's gonna be the last slide. I have these extra slides up here, Grace, just in case uh, we need them. Thank you. I also have Nate uh, Bueller. Yes, uh, Nate Bueller with Cambridge Properties, speaking on behalf of the applicant. Um, I appreciate your consideration of this project. It's been about a year and a half in the in the works as we've gotten to what we have to present to you today. Um, I won't hash through what Robert spoke to in, in too much uh, additional detail, but long, long story short, we began evaluating this site on the front end as a multifamily development. Um, about a year and eight months ago, um, based on the plan improvements to US 70, um, which would allow for access to proximate employment centers in downtown Raleigh and downtown Durham, we felt it was a great opportunity for an infill residential project that would fit those qualifications. Um, as we went further down the line with our initial submittal, including a meeting with the neighbors, um, the feedback on, on that initial proposal was overwhelmingly negative. From the surrounding residents as robert spoke to related to renter profile concerns tr additional traffic based on the intensity of our proposal um, as well as the overall intensity of the project um, that coupled with the market analysis that we completed um, just looking at surrounding rents the surrounding market for multifamily, family um, coupled with the neighborhood feedback um, 
cause us to reconsider our initial proposal, um, come back, resubmit our zoning for a, a townhome development um, that we thought would would be a better fit based on both the neighborhood feedback and based on the marketplace. Um, we held a second neighborhood meeting with the surrounding community. The overall mean feedback was much more positive um, based on reduced traffic impact due to a lower volume of unit count, uh, lower intensity of the development, and overall change from a renter profile to a purchaser profile, um, which we understood based on our meetings with the neighbors. Uh, from a, a pricing perspective, uh, our goals here are to position these townhomes in the $240,000 to $260,000 range, which from our analysis of the market is a, a good starter position and one in which would allow a first time home buyer to build equity in a home over time and eventually move up to a, a larger uh, a larger home or, or townhome or, or what have you. Um, again, we, have, we appreciate your, your consideration and would, would gladly speak to any additional questions as it relates to the plan. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a hand raised uh, by staff, Emily uh, Struthers. Thank you. I just uh, real quick wanted to clarify that the um, things in, uh, sorry, Robert Schunk's uh, presentation regarding project information, um, unit size and block length, those items are not committed elements. And I just want to make that clarification for the record. Thank you. Thank you. I do not have other individuals who have signed up to speak, but I'm going to check to see if there are any additional individuals who would like to speak um, to this item before I close the public hearing and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Seeing no additional hands, I'm going to close the public hearing and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I see Commissioner Miller's hand. The chair recognizes Commissioner Tom Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Commission Member Miller here. Um, I make a contrast of this project to the uh, one we just talked about. Uh, it's my understanding, and the developer will, uh, or the applicant will correct me if I have it wrong, that um, as of yet, there is no end builder for this project identified. And so this is one of those rezonings where a uh, request for committed elements uh, with regard to design and, and uh, other features uh, the, that the applicant feels reluctant to make those kind of commitments uh, because uh, it might affect their ability to um, find somebody ultimately to purchase the property and develop it. Uh, I've never been a fan of doing development plan zoning under these circumstances. And so unless uh, my fellow commission members through their comments and questions convince me otherwise, I will probably vote against this rezoning request. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak to this issue? Commissioner Bryan, did I see your hand? Okay, I see you. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak to this issue? Oh. Uh, Commissioner Al Turk. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be brief. I, um, I, I do think that I agree with the applicant that this is a good location for a residential development. So I'm, I'm okay with the change from commercial to low medium density, or sorry, to uh, yeah, in, in the slum and then uh, to RSM with the development plan as the zoning map designation. Um, I would like, I mean, I, I think the, the big concern for me here is that in particular, because this is on a, I don't know, a busy, busy road. It, the, it's on a uh, bus line that goes to down, both to downtown and to Briar Creek. Um, I, I think it would be it would be good here to have again the things that we've talked about for other cases, which is a mix of housing types, and you know to try to promote affordability on site. Um, and so I will just you know I will uh, echo what Commissioner Miller or his you know, suggestion from the last case, 
which was the uh, the recommendation of limiting the the square footage of the units and and I'll, I'll say that recognizing that I think if I'm correct in my memory um, Robert Schunk was probably the first he brought us the first case where we saw that kind of commitment and so I'd, I'd be curious from the applicant if they would consider a commitment like that on this for this because I, I, um, I think it's important to kind of promote if we're not going to have different housing types to have different as Commissioner Miller pointed out last the last case you know different price points different uh, a, a, a mix of, of um, sizes and so I'll, I'll uh, leave it there and hope the applicant will, will respond thank you so Commissioner Alturk, are you directing your question to the applicant? Yes. To respond? Yes. Okay, and okay. that- Nate, Nate, if you wanna to speak to that. Sure, um, backing up just very briefly in reference to Commissioner Miller's point uh, regarding the, the status of this project, we, we do have a builder that we are working with on this project. Um, we are just not yet in a position to reveal the name of that specific builder. Um, and as far as the, related design commitments, I can can speak to that in a little bit more detail um, if, if, if required um, based on our previous discussion. Um, in regards to a commitment towards a max unit size, um, with where we are in the design process, we have a, a rough idea of what that will be. I would ask that we be permitted to discuss that internally to make sure that we are within a square footage that is consistent with our future plans with our current builder partner before we are able to comment in direct regard to that. Um, but but I, I, I would like to say that we would be able to discuss that internally and then circle back with you on that specific point. Thank you. Um, and that was a response to Commissioner Al Turk's uh, question. Yes, can I, can I respond to that very quickly? Well, uh, yes, I, I want to make sure that because these are commissioner uh, comments and um, so we had an applicant to speak again and we really, once the public hearing is closed, they can only respond to questions from the commissioners. Just a reminder, so um, that particular uh, recognition was in regards to your question. Yes. I guess I will. I will wait to see if other if other commissioners have a, a similar uh, uh, concern or, or or think that this would be a good idea before I uh, I guess push the, the the applicant for 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 this specifically. So I'll, I'll wait to see what other commissioners have to say. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, the chair recognizes Commissioner Johnson at this time, followed by Commissioner Durkin. Chairwoman Hyman. And so just in response to your um, comments and, and inquiry, uh, Commissioner Alex Turk, I too uh, uh, think that this is an opportunity given the, the context in which we do our work here on, on the commission in the sense that we can't demand or require any kind of proper regarding, you know, affordability or unit mix types or whatnot. We're hoping that that is something that's presented to us or, or that the applicant is, is willing to entertain as part of, of their application. You know, the reality is, is that, you know, even a smaller uh, unit size doesn't necessarily guarantee affordability. But when we look at the alternatives that we have, it's one of the, one of the more viable approaches to trying to ensure that there is some kind of mix of, of you know, income that's a part of these developments that we're coming about that that are coming on uh, in the pipeline. The reality is, is that two hundred and forty to two hundred and sixty thousand dollars is is still a pretty good, you know, <laughs> uh, mortgage to try to go into a bank and get right. And understanding that that may be accessible to a segment of uh, the Durham residents here, you know, we still are tasked with asking the question: Is what can we possibly do to address this in a way that makes the most sense given the parameters set out for us. There, I mean, $45,000 to the affordable housing unit, uh, uh, to the affordable housing fund, is not really moving the needle, right? So it's, you can double that and we're still having the same conversation. And so still understanding that the developer has, has 
an incentive to make the project work for them from the numbers standpoint. The question for us is like, what can we do given, again, the parameters? And I think that this is something that I would be interested in seeing what the uh, applicant comes can can present us with in regards to is it doable or not. Otherwise, it's like we're still at our default level of still hoping that we can find a way to move forward, particularly on the workforce uh, affordable housing piece. And uh, we just we have limited options. And so that's my feedback, particularly to that comment that you raised. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the chair recognizes Commissioner Durkin. Um, I wanted to echo those sentiments as well. I would be more inclined to vote for this project if it was multifamily needing an apartment building and not attached single family development. And I would, I'm still waiting for someone to utilize that affordable housing density of Venice, waiting and I keep waiting for it and it's not happening. And I understand that the response might be that it's not worth it. Um, but I, I agree that a $40,000, and I, there's not a profit here, I don't see for anything for the dedicated housing fund. Um, but I don't think that those deposits really do anything. Um, if they do not create affordable housing in the same capacity, you can't build affordable housing for that amount of money. So um, again, I'm not in favor of this project, given the fact that it doesn't contribute to the need for affordable housing, whether or not it's through the density bonus or through market forces of size and price. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other commissioners who would like to speak? I do not see any additional hands raised at this time. I'm going to double check once more. Then I would like to entertain a motion. Excuse me, Madam Chair, I have an opportunity to, to speak one final point in regards to some of the questions that were raised prior to the motion being taken. This is Nate Bueller with Cambridge Properties, the applicant. Unless one of the commissioners has an additional question, I cannot recognize you because I've closed the public hearing, but the commissioners are free to ask questions. So once again, I will check. Um, I do have Commissioner Johnson. I will recognize Commissioner Johnson. Thank you again, Cheryl. I will be interested in hearing any feedback that the applicant may have based on the, the most recent comments regarding the uh, unit sizes, and if so, would uh, the applicant be willing to go circle back with his internal team and and maybe come back to the commission with more information regarding is that something possible that can be proffered for this uh, request? Thank you. This is Nate, Nate Bueller, Cambridge Properties, the applicant. Um, in regards to the specific unit sizes, what what we do know at, at this point in discussions with our, our partner on this project is that we could commit to 22 foot and 20, 26 foot wide lot widths. The building floor plans that they have planned for this project, I cannot speak to the exact square footage of those at this point, but Robert Schunk's pro proposal in the, his presentation of 1600 to 2200 square feet is relatively consistent with what their end product would be. Um, so not knowing at this point the exact square footage of those of the of the max, um, I would like to request that we are, were able to to speak with them and confirm that. But what we could commit to at this point would be twenty two foot wide and twenty six foot wide max lot widths. Uh, yeah, and, and this is Robert. Hey Cedric, I'd like to follow up on that. If, Excuse if I may. me. Um, it, this has to be in response to a commissioner's question. Yeah, this is specific to the context of where there are other affordable housing units within this area it's not just you know within a stone's throw of this i think it'll help the context of this conversation just double checking commissioner johnson this is in response to your the information or clarification you're seeking If not, the, I'm going to recognize Commissioner Al Turk. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was muted. I'm sorry. I was. <laughs> I hear nothing now. I think he's his internet's locked up. Can you all hear me? 
now? There is a, I can hear you, there's an echo, something's happening. Uh -oh. let, me, let me recognize Commissioner Al Turk, who had the, the same um, question to see, if the, to see if the applicant then can respond to his question. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess I'll just, I'll ask the applicant a more direct question, a very specific question. Are you, you know, would you like some time to consider uh, both, you know, kind of having a more specific uh, square footage commitment and, and I would echo what Commissioner Durkin mentioned, which is, you know, kind of considering the, uh, the inclusion here of multifamily homes or multifamily units, excuse me, uh, in, on this site. So I, I guess I'll just, the, the, the very specific question is to the applicant, would they like, uh, you know, one or two cycle uh, delay or continuance uh, to discuss this with the builder uh, and to give it and to, to think about a more specific uh, more specific commitments. This is Nate Bueller on behalf of the applicant. Um, at this point, as as we alluded to, we would be willing to commit to 22 foot and 20 26 foot wide lot widths. Um, we cannot speak to the exact square footage of the unit, um, but that is what we're willing to commit to at this point. Regarding inclusion of multifamily housing at this site, again, based on our analysis of the marketplace, the size of this site as a natural infill site, in our opinion, does not facilitate a multi-using, a multi-housing type development, that include both townhomes and multifamily. Our discussions with the marketplace and a year and a half of analysis of this site. Um, we have tried to put forth with this proposal based on neighbors, based on the market, based on our analysis, what we feel like is the most appropriate use for the site based on those factors. So again, we are willing to commit to 22 foot wide and 22, 26 foot wide lot widths, um, but we we cannot commit to anything else at this point. Thank you. Um, the staff has a hand raised, so I'm going to recognize Emily Struthers at this time. Thank you. I just want some clarification on um, commitments and, and whatnot that may be being thrown out there. I had heard some discussions previously, I think, about affordable housing um, contributions, and I don't believe any of those commitments have been proffered. If that is not the case, please let me know. Um, I'm currently uh, checking with uh, senior staff regarding the uh, maximum lot width, and if that's something we can accept at this meeting or if we need to further vet it, I'll uh, get back to you on that one. And if you could please confirm that initial um, any contribution or if that was just some discuss side discussion or news. Thank you. There's no, just, uh, there's no. no affordable housing um, uh, proffer made at this time uh, due to the uncertainty of the costs associated with the sewer capacity, um, not the sewer capacity, excuse me, the sewer serviceability. For instance, if we go to the county, we have to add a pump station. Um, if the county insists that we drain to the county and the city, we might have to, you know, pay a significant basin fee to the city to, you know, to drain to the city. So it, it would be inappropriate at this time until the city uh, works that out to, um, to, uh, you know, to make a proffer at this time. Thank you. Thank you. I see additional hand raised. Um, I'm going to double check with you, Commissioner Johnson, to see if your hand is still up. It's lowered. I'm good. I'm good. Thank to go you. Through. Thank you. And then uh, Commissioner Miller. Is your so thank you. Ready? Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is Commission Member Miller. Uh, so I would like to be able to vote in favor of this project, but I can't until it has committed elements that bend the project towards the, the policy interest uh, that certainly I'm interested in and that a great many of my fellow commission members are interested in. I note, though, that we've got a sewer thing that's got to be worked out no matter what happens. And so that's going to burn time. I don't see the harm in giving this another 60 days. Uh, then it can come back and we'll know what the sewer issue is. And we'll know whether or not there is money for a contribution to the affordable housing fund. If they choose to make it, we will uh, also, they will also have a time to, to talk with their um, uh, their builder uh, partners uh, 
about the kind of commitments that they could make that would make me an enthusiastic supporter of this project. And as long as the sewer thing has got to be worked out, uh, I'm inclined to just let this one ride. I, um, why not? Um, those are my feelings, and I'll make a motion to that effect uh, if, if I'm called on to do that, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Yes, I still have two additional hands uh, to double check with Commissioner Alter. Have you raised your hand uh, to speak? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I just wanted to uh, uh, note that I think Commissioner Kenshin has been trying to get our attention. Uh, I don't know if that's the case or not, but it seems like that's the case. Um, and then I, I will support Commissioner Miller's uh, motion of continuance. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kitchen, have you? Yes, and I apologize that I, ha I don't know how to do the hand raised piece on the Zoom feature, so I'm doing it the old fashioned way. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, my comment is um, I do think, um, you know, the, the, the multifamily works, um, sorry, the single family works well there, I think. Uh, on Miami Boulevard, both ends have a quite number, uh, quite a number of pieces of um, multifamily. So does Andrew Avenue. So I think it could work there. I agree with Commissioner Miller. I want to, I want to vote yes. I think this would be a good thing for Durham. My question to the applicant, though, is uh, you met with the residents the first time, and then you went back to the drawing board and made changes. Uh, what was the result um, in the subsequent meeting that you had with the applicants? Sure, this is uh, Nate Bueller, Cambridge Properties, on behalf of the applicant. Um, our initial neighborhood meeting was was held as we spoke for um, for multifamily of 280 units. Um, based on feedback from the neighbors regarding the intensity of that project, traffic concerns, as well as the overall uh, intensity of the development as a whole, um, the overwhelming feedback to that end was negative from the surrounding community members. Um, Taking that into account, along with other market related factors, we went back to the drawing board and came back to the neighbors with a proposal that we felt would be more in line with their concerns, which was for 115 townhome units um, for sale product. That directly addressed in our meeting with them, their concerns related to traffic, related to the intensity of their project, related to their preference for a for sale versus a for rent product. Um, and it, to that end, um, as we've worked through that process from the initial zoning submittal to the amended zoning submittal, um, we've been delayed 90 days, 120 days individually on each of those components. So we would we would also like to to focus on, if if possible, uh, a, a vote this evening um, in regards to this project as it relates to our uh, movement forward. Um, just understanding the amount of delays we've already incurred over the last near two years on this project. Thank you. Um, staff, ha I, I see a staff hand for Emily Struthers again at this time. Yes. Thank you. I was just uh, checking back in about that uh, proposed tax commitment. Um, we are able to accept at this time uh, maximum lot width, but I need a clarification. I believe I heard a maximum of 22 and a maximum of 26. Um, I'm not sure how the two maximums work here. Could I please uh, get some clarification on what the proposed tax commitment language is? Thank you. A maximum lot width of 26 feet, and that is Nate Bueller uh, on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. So no reference to 22, just the maximum of 26. Thank you. I also, um, I see no other, well, Commissioner Miller has his hand raised. The chair recognizes Commissioner Miller. Okay. Uh, only for the purpose, uh, Madam Chairman, Commission Member Miller, only for the purpose of uh, making the motion to push this back to our regularly scheduled meeting in August, but I'm not going to do that unless there is uh, some support among the Commission members. Well, at this time, since I see no additional hands, uh, I'm going to entertain a motion on this item. Chair yes. Hunter. Yes. I move that we send case A19 
quadruple zero seven to the city with a favorable recommendation. Second. Thank you. Motion by Commissioner Al Turk, second by Commissioner Busby that we send item A19 triple zero zero seven the four five four one one five Andrew Avenue forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Um, I will entertain a roll call vote for this item, please. Commissioner Morgan. Yes. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Bryan? Okay, that's a no. Commissioner Durkin? No. Commissioner Altar? No. Vice Chair Busby? No. Chair Hyman? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Kinchin? No. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe? Commissioner Lowe? No. 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 Uh, Commissioner McIver? No. No. Is that it? No. No? Okay. I'm sorry. Our motion uh, fails uh, 12 to 1. Excuse me, fails one to 12. I got that backwards last time too. Thank you. I'd like to entertain a motion for the concurrent, the zoning map change, the concurrent part of this. Um, yeah, I, have a I move that we send case Z19-0014 forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. Second. Motion by Commissioner Al Turk, second by Commissioner Busby, that we send item Z19014 or 115 Anger Avenue forward to the City Council with the favorable recommendation. All in favor of this motion, may we have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? No. Commissioner Brine. I copy that. That's a no. Commissioner Durkin? No. Commissioner Alturk? No. Commissioner Busby? No. Chair Hyman? No. Commissioner Miller? No. Commissioner Keenchin? No. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe. Commissioner Lowe. No. No. Got you. Commissioner McIver. No. No. Okay. Um, motion fails one to twelve. Thank you. And um, and would I, uh, very quickly, Madam um, Chair, would, I'd like to correct earlier when I uh, read the motions for the first case, I said they failed nine to four, but they actually failed four to nine. Thank you for the correction. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, our next uh, public hearing item is uh, A1900008, Farrington Towns. We're ready for the staff report, please. And it also, um, uh, map amendment as well as concurrent zoning map changes. So we two items. Staff report, please. Good evening, Emily Struthers with the Planning Department. Uh, now presenting case Z19-00023 and A19-0008, uh, Farrington Towns. This case was previously heard at the December 12th Planning Commission meeting. At that meeting, the applicant agreed to retain a large, the larger of the two wetlands shown on the existing condition sheet, and Planning Commission recommended approval at that meeting with a vote of 11 to 1. The applicant has since modified the plan to remove both wetlands. While wetlands are regulated at the state and federal level, the significant modifications require that the case be referred back to the Planning Commission, and here we are. Uh, the zoning context map here, uh, as a reminder, this 3.87 acre site, shown in red at the corner of Farrington and Old Chapel Hill Road, is located in the suburban tier adjacent to the Patterson Place compact neighborhood tier. 
and it's within the Falls Jordan District B watershed protection overlay. The applicant proposes to change the zoning from residential suburban 20 to residential suburban multifamily with a development plan for a maximum of 25 multi multifamily units. The proposed zoning is not consistent with the future land use map designation of low density residential, but the applicant is seeking a FLUM amendment to low medium density residential, which would be consistent with the rezoning request. Staff analysis of the proposal's consistency with policies has not changed. More information can be found in the staff report and staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. I do have three individuals who have signed up to speak to this issue. Uh, Jarrett Eden. Hello, can you hear me? A little bit loud. Hello? Yes, there you are. Okay, good. Um, good evening, uh, Jarrett Eden. It's nice to see you guys. Um, yeah, the reason we're here this evening is I, I really, I, I gave you some bad information at our last meeting. Um, there's two pockets of wetlands on the property, both along the southern boundary. We were proposing to eliminate one and keep the other with the original development plan. And I'd actually, I believe I described that upper wetland pocket as a pond uh, at our meeting, which was not good information. It, it's actually completely wooded. Uh, the entire property is wooded. Um, it's a it's a jurisdictional wetland, uh, but even both added up together are well short of uh, what we call an individual permit through the core. This is the kind of impact that the core would in, would permit in about 30 days uh, with both impacts. So it just didn't make sense to save what turned out to be a wooded area and not a pond. So uh, we're back before you tonight to make that change. And I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Anderson. Yes. I'm uh, available to answer any questions. I've got an echo in my ear, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, thank you. And uh, Lauren Matas. Hello, this is Lauren. Um, I don't have anything to add right now, but can answer any questions if needed. Thank you. I do not have any other individuals who have signed up to speak, but I'm going to check uh, to see if there are any other individuals who would like to speak to this case. If not, I'm going to close the public hearing and give our commissioners an opportunity to ask questions. So I will now check to see if there are commissioners who would like to speak to this issue. Uh, the chair recognizes Commissioner Busby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. I'll ask the obvious yeah. for, for everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. I'll ask the obvious question for everybody. I mean, there's only one issue here. And uh, Mr. Edens, I, I'm confused because the existing conditions map says that this is an existing wetland. And I remember talking about it at the last meeting. And if I recall, I think Commissioner Johnson's comments from the meeting reminded me that the last time there was an inconsistency in the between the report and the map. So the map said that this was going to be removed and we we asked about that and you had noted that that was incorrect that it was going to be saved which is what the report had indicated but uh so anyway i've been kind of confused about this whole thing but that was the key to my vote the last time so it, explain to me why is it listed as a, a large the larger of the two wetlands on the existing conditions map but you're saying it's not a wetlands it's a forest I, I'm, I'm just confused about what's going on here no, they're both wetland areas are identical. So with the with the last application, the commission approved impacting the lower wetlands, which looks identical to the upper wetland. Uh, so oftentimes you can get an area that's delineated as a jurisdictional wetland, but it doesn't mean that there's standing water. It doesn't mean there's anything evident. Oftentimes it just looks like what it looks like today, which is a wooded area. So uh, knowing that the Corps of Engineers who 
you know, they govern this and they set the rules and they have always allowed anything under a one half acre impact uh, to be approved I mean, rather quickly. 30 days is, is a pretty quick permit. So in this case, um, there's, it's just not a significant environmental feature, uh, in my opinion. You know, if it was a pond, it would be different. But uh, I don't know. I, I sent a, a photo to Emily. I don't know if it's av available, but um, I mean, it's a completely wooded site. So you know, I'm not sure what that would be. Well, and I guess two follow-up questions. One is you, you just said that that they're the same size. I mean, to my eye, it looks twice as big as the other one, the upper one on the existing conditions map. So what, explain that to me. No, I, I said they have the same exact same characteristics. Okay. They, they, they're both governed by the same rules. So if, if it's, you know, technically the impacting the lower one is the same as impacting the upper one. It's the same permit, same rules. Okay. And we're we're getting back there. Yeah, yeah that's, that's helpful to get the picture. Uh, so while we look at the picture, the final question is when we saw this the last time in December, you were okay with having it preserved. So what, what changed? I mean, to explain what need, what changed from your end that you needed to come back and to make that clarification. It was a mistake on my part. I mean, it, the original application should have shown it to be removed. Um, and it just was, was missed. So we're back today to, to rectify that. We're not changing the unit count, not changing anything from the last approval, which was 11 to one. Uh, we're just proposing impacting an additional, I think nine or 10,000 square feet of area. Okay. I, I'm still confused. We talked about this and you specifically said that this would be preserved, but I understand why you're coming back. Uh, I'm not happy about it. I'll just leave it there. I'm gonna vote. Yeah, I, I understand. The preservation was the mistake. I mean, my commitment to that was the mistake. So I'm, I'm here to rectify that. I will check to see if there are other commissioners who would like to speak to this issue. I do see a hand. Uh, Commissioner Tom Miller. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is Tom Miller. Um, so when I look at the aerial, both in our packet, which is unfortunately shaded over because it has to be, uh, and also the aerial picture that you just showed us, which is uh, from the oblique rather than directly over it. I mean, it is clear that this the area where this wetlands that we're talking about is, uh, does not have the same tree cover as the rest of the property. That kind of dark place that you see there, that's the wetlands. And it also shows in the aerial in our, uh, picture um so if and while as a matter of as a regulatory matter uh the corps of engineers may treat it all the same uh i do believe that as a uh, feature in the landscape this wetland is uh, different the other thing is too and i may be mistaken on and i'm kind of flipping through my sheets here the other change that uh comes up in in the application as we now have it is uh having something to do with um, a bike pad. Is that not right? Was there a commitment to about sidewalks or b bike lanes and that's now changing? I'm, I'm not aware of, I don't know. If, I'm not aware of any changes other than this wetland issue. This doesn't have anything to do with the wetlands. This has to do with, is there a change from when we first saw this? And I think it's important to note that this has come up. We voted on it. It did not go to, it has not been voted on by city council. So this is us looking at the same rezoning. Uh, 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 in other words, a new rezoning of the same site. Uh, uh, but the other rezoning was never resolved. Uh, the, the staff said substantial change. And so it's coming back to us just like it did the first time. Um, so is there no change to uh, anything with regard to uh, bicycle and pedestrian? I'll ask staff of that about that. Thank you. And I do have a raised hand by uh, Emily Struthers. Thank you. Uh, staff just wanted to confirm that there is no change beyond that one wetland um, revision. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that clarification. Maybe that was something I read in another case. 
Thank you. The Thank chair, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The chair recognizes Commissioner um, Johnson. Thank you, Chairwoman. Can you all hear me better now? Yes. Thank you. So I guess my question uh, is for Jared. Um, I did reach out to him just to the commission uh, members. I reached out to him prior just to try to get an understanding of you know this seemingly so issue that we're being asked to focus on tonight. But my question to Jared now is, uh, it may be a twofold question, but the first one is, given that you're requesting that that uh, what we referred to in the when we initially considered it a pun, uh, that it will go away, or is the intent to um, make that developable, um, that parcel, that section of the, the parcel developable now? Will something go on that? No, that's possible for sure. I mean, it, it's just, in my opinion, I've, I've been doing this a long time, this is this is not something worth worth designing around, especially when I, I have an approval from the last vote to impact the lower fees. Um, and, and we got a good vote, you know, we got 11 one vote last time. So I, I would hope that some of that would still be in play. And just a follow up question. So um, uh, am I correct in from what I've, I've heard you share and your comments to particularly uh, Commissioner Busby's inquiries is that when you initially came, was it that, what was it, now I'm thinking through our conversation, but was it that you, you it was agreed that you didn't have to, but you agree, you were willing to agree which you ultimately did to preserve it, or was it that you were required to, which I don't think is the case, which is it the former or the latter that led you to agree to uh, keep that, that feature on the site? Yeah, I mean, there, there's no Army Corps of Engineer rules that would prohibit us from filling all of those wetlands. And again, they're, they're the one, they're charged with determining, you know, what is significant and what is not. And I just know from experience, they're, they're going to allow this removal rather quickly. Um, so were you agreeing to keep it on because you, you're, you were thinking that you would, you would be required to keep it through whatever process you, are, you now realize that you can go through and not have to keep it? So was it you just basically betting that you would have to keep it as part of why it was no problem for you to agree to keep the feature on the site when we initially considered this? No, I, I had a clear understanding of what was there. So I think I even used the word pond. I know when I was talking with Brian, I know I used the word pond. And if it was a pond, I don't think I would be back here this evening. I just, I had the wrong information. I described it incorrectly and I'm here to rectify that. Um, but again, these are, a very minor feature. Okay. So, so, um, to, so it seems, so what I, from what I've heard is that the applicant thought that there was a pun feature on the, the site, which was raised. I remember our pre meeting before that first meeting with Jared. And then I asked when we had the meeting. And so he agreed because if we had that conversation around, like, how could we, could we put, a trail or something, and he was like, it's so close to the road, da, 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 but he agreed to keep it. So now he's saying that his comments suggest that it's not necessarily a pun, and so since it's not considered a pun, it's not worth preserving on the site. And I guess the, the question is, I have to the commission is, is there any thoughts or reasons why if it's not a pond feature that we should be pushing to keep the feature on the site? And if so, I'm just curious as to what would be the value add or the benefit of keeping that pond, uh, that, that feature on the site. And or if we are willing to ac accept this request, should we be asking questions to see what could, what could potentially go on that part of the site that was not going to go there because we was going to keep this undevelopable feature, uh, feature on the site? Hope that makes sense, but if not, let me know and I'll try to clarify. Thanks, Chairwoman. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Um, Chair recognizes Commissioner Miller at this time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tom Miller. Um, so uh, speaking to the, the case altogether, I supported this case before uh, and I, uh, after having listened and gotten some clarification about why we're looking at it again, 
I have decided I support it. Now, looking at the overall picture, um, we have a corner site that is got a church to the south in RS20. Uh, it's got um, single family homes on the other side of Farrington Road, south of Chapel Hill Road. Mm -hmm. There is a PDR of 3.620 uh, to the west. And then across Ch Old Chapel Hill Road, the property is zoned support two uh, for the Patterson Place compact neighborhood, which is would allow considerably uh, more intense uh, and varied development. Uh, so what's being asked for here is the ability to build 25 multifamily units on a corner site that in my opinion is a lousy place for single family homes on large lots. Um, and while this is just a 3.9 acre tract, it's not even that big, um, in the area, there is highly diverse housing of all types, all ages, and all sizes. Uh, it seems to me that the applicant's argument that this is a good transition from the significantly more intense uh, develop that, development that is allowed on the north side of Old Chapel Hill Road uh, to the uh, mixture of residential development that appears on the south side and will actually add a component of housing, which is multifamily, uh, that doesn't exist there today. Uh, under these circumstances, unless somebody can explain to me uh, the environmental significance of this small wetland, uh, which could be removed, um, I'm inclined to vote for this again, uh, uh, even though it is a slightly different project. It seems to me a good place to build uh, multifamily housing in the uh, regulatory and built environment that surrounds it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes Commissioner Morgan, followed by Commissioner Lowe. Commissioner you, Morgan. Madam, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I was actually had the benefit of actually just since we were doing the Zoom and remote thing, I was looking at the Google Maps. I could see where the applicant could be confused, where the map shows a pond. But in the picture, I just see a forested area. So I just wanted to make a point of clarification in noticing that I can see where the, the misinterpretation might have been made because it shows up on one and not the other. Have you been looking through my computer? <laughs> that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what, on the GIS, it's a, it's a big blue blob on the GIS and underneath there's nothing there. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lowe. Yes, um, just my own clarification. Um, so th this is not a pond and this is not wetland. Is that correct? It is a jurisdictional wetland. Yes, it, it is ju a jurisdictional wetland, which is uh, governed by the Corps of Engineers. But sometimes that means there's okay. a presence of- My, my next question is kind of a two-fold question. Okay. My next question is kind of a two-fold question. Um, if you were to keep that wetland there, what's the best thing can come out of that? And then other part of my question is, if you did not keep it, What's the worst thing that could come out of that? I mean, I want to clarify, just because we're seeking permission to remove it doesn't necessarily mean that all of it will be removed because we still have a tree preservation requirement for the site. We still have an open space requirement for the site. This is an area where you have a draw running through. So, you know, ideally you, you wouldn't have too many structures around it. I don't know where the buildings are going to be. I do want the right, you know, to build anywhere on the site. But there, there's no guarantee we'll impact all of it. It's just, uh, again, it, it's just insignificant in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, does that uh, complete your question, Commissioner Lowe? Thank you. Uh, the chair recognizes Commissioner <laughs> Al, thank you. Al Turk, followed by Commissioner Durkin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, 
think I mostly agree with, or I agree with uh, Commissioner Miller that this is, you know, I voted in favor of this as well. And it, it seems to me to it, it makes sense to have what's being proposed on this on this site. I do think though that the question that Commissioner Johnson brought up you know, is, is worth asking, which is, you know, is, is it worth it to preserve this wetland? Um, and I, I guess I would not to put Commissioner Busby on the spot, but I'm, I'm curious if you could elaborate more on your position. You don't, obviously you don't have to, but I'm, I just wanna be a little bit more clear about why, um, you know, we should try to preserve this wetland and vote against this tonight. Thank you. Commissioner Alturk, that was directed to me. Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, it's been helpful to hear the conversation. Uh, I, I remember, personally, I just remember this conversation at the meeting. And to me, that was, that was for, for me personally, that was the moment when I decided I was on the fence. Uh, I decided that that conversation and that clarification, uh, knowing that that's an area that all of Durham has a lot of flooding issues, we're heading into additional climate change. Uh, we're seeing lots of neighbors complain about flooding issues. You've got a school across the street. So that was the moment for me where I tipped into being a yes vote. So I'm not expecting any of you to vote uh, no with me tonight, but uh, I would ask you just to think about a case where there was one moment, one item that you thought, okay, on the whole, that last thing I heard is what is gonna lead me to a yes vote. Uh, that rarely happens, it's right back in front of us. But reading back through this, I was recalling that was the moment where we clarified that that would be protected, that I thought on the whole, this seems like uh, a case that I'm gonna vote yes for. So, but as Commissioner Miller said in a previous case, I won't hold it against any of you if you remain yes votes. There, there are a lot of compelling reasons why uh, we need we need development in Durham. This is an area that makes sense to have development take place. And um, but but for me that was the that was the issue that pushed me to a yes vote. So we're taking it out. So I'm I'm going to vote no. Thank you. Now Commissioner Durkin. I was not. I was absent in December, so I did not get to ask a couple questions. Um, one of them is: Can you clarify? Uh, for the applicant, can you clarify what you mean by multi-family units? This would be townhomes. Okay, so to, it, I think I think of those as attached to um, single family. So that I think um, aids in in my analysis of this. Um, and I was curious. I couldn't. I just was looking on the website for the December agenda packet, and I couldn't find it. But I'm curious what the development plan looks like in December. What did the building parking lot on the area look like? Um, what's now, it's page DV2 of the plan. Is that go around the wetlands that would now be removed? It did, it did. So you could build the 25 units on the remainder of this parcel without disturbing the jurisdictional wetlands. It's possible for sure, uh, but but uh, just as a designer in my experience and, and just knowing how many wetland impacts our plans have shown over the years that the commission has approved, I just don't think this is worth trying to design around, in my opinion. So um, it's just an, an unnecessary restriction that I think we need to remove. So I, I'm, I honestly don't know what a jurisdictional wetlands is versus a wetlands without it being qualified as being jurisdictional. Um, but given the conversation, I just, and I I know you're saying that it's not environmentally significant, but it's not been proven to be environmentally insignificant. And I think the, the, the tree preservation area that's shown on page DV2 of the development of the site plan um, is very minimal and is really just relegated to a tiny little corner of the lot. So that and what I'm assuming is the church parcel. So I'm also, if you're able to build 25 units on almost two acres is very, very, very little. Um, and so I'm also inclined to say no on this one. If we're able to preserve those jurisdictional wetlands and still build what you had been planning to or what your client had been planning to. Thank you. 
uh, the chair recognizes Commissioner. Well, I saw a hand. And Commissioner Miller, did you have your hand up? I did, but, <laughs> but I think we're circling around here, so. Thank you. I've had my say. Thank you. Are there any additional questions that, uh, and I'm gonna ask this question only because this is unusual, but questions must come from the commissioners and the applicant has raised his hand. Are there, are there any commissioners who have any additional questions from the applicant? Well, I guess I would one before Commissioner Commission. withdrew his hand. So if, yeah. and I was a, a, a no. So my question is if you have a response to my position, then you're more than welcome to share it. Or if you have, if you think that what I have said needs to be clarified, then. And this is maybe so. thank you. Yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't, I didn't mean to raise my hand. If, if I did, um, I it just, was one point I would one point I would make. I, I think the environmental significance is reflected by the fact that the Corps of Engineers will let me remove it in thirty days. And when for significant features for an individual permit, it takes over a year. You have public hearings. That's where the Corps gets really involved. But I think. The fact that, that the people who regulate it will allow me to remove it fairly easily is a reflection of its significance. Can I actually clarify that? Have you gotten approval to remove it or you just expect that you will? Uh, I completely expect that we will. It's, it's a, a rubber stamp, a, a nationwide permit 30 days is, is just going through the process, honestly. I'm not comfortable enough, especially not being an environmental engineer or a jurisdictional weapons expert of any shape or form to rely on your assumption that you'll receive it as a rubber stamp to change my vote. I understood. I'm just going on my experience. Thank you. Uh, the commissioner Miller has his hand raised. Right. So let me work this through. And Jared, would you tell me if I've got it wrong? With the development plan, the way it was submitted for our consideration last time, you were going to commit to preserving this wetland, essentially taking uh, whether it's saved or not saved out of the hands of the Corps of Engineers because you were promising the city of Durham that you were going to save it. Is that right? Right. And now what you're trying to, what you're saying is, is what you wanna do is withdraw that promise, take it out of the hands of the city of Durham and leave it entirely up to the Army Corps of Engineers who has uh, uh, its own jurisdiction over uh, protecting identified wetlands according to rules and standards uh, that govern its decision making. Is that right? And you, while you anticipate that they will approve you being able to eliminate this wetland, it's, it's not a clear thing and they might require you to save it. Uh, but whatever happens, it won't be a zoning question at that point. Correct. Uh, but one thing that we haven't talked about here, and this may address what Mr. Busby was talking about, that when you build on this property, you are going to have to provide some sort of stormwater mitigation here, which may or may, and also tree save, which may or may not use uh, some or all of the portion of the land that is now designated wetlands. Correct. Thank you. Are there any additional commissioners who um, would like to ask questions at this time? Have you heard um, all of the clarification that you need from the applicant, even though one of the applicants, uh, Mr. James Anderson, raised his hand, but only in response to if there's any additional clarification from commissioners? Hearing none, then I will entertain a motion. Madam Chair, Mr. Uh, I move we send case, I just lost it, A19008 forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Motion by Commissioner Busby, second by Commissioner Al Turk that we send item A19000008 Barrington Towns forward to the city council with a favorable recommendation 
All in favor of this motion, a roll call vote, please. Um, Commissioner. Uh, what was that again? Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Oh. No. 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 Okay. Commissioner Bryan? Um, can you pull your sign back a little bit? Okay, gotcha. It's a yes. Commissioner Durkin? No. Commissioner Al Turk? Yes. Commission, uh, excuse me, Vice Chair Busby? No. Chair Hyman? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Commissioner Miller? I was holding my sign up. Um, oh. No. Strike that. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Miller, um, excuse me, Kenshin? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Is that a no? No. Okay. Commissioner Lowe? No. And Commissioner MacGyver? No. Okay, got you, Commissioner Lowe. Commissioner MacGyver? No. No? Okay. Oh, this is tight. Um, motion fails uh, six seven. Madam Chair, I would move we uh that we move case Z one nine triple zero two three forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Raise your hand for that second to make sure I know who that was. Commissioner Morgan, I believe. Yes. Okay, correct? thank you. Or was that low? It was Commissioner Morgan. Okay, <laughs> sorry. All right. Motion, motion, motion by Commissioner Busby, second by Commissioner Morgan, that we send item Z1900023 Farrington Towns forward to the City Council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor of this motion, may we have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Morgan. Yes. Commissioner Johnson. No. Commissioner Bryan. Yes. Commissioner Durkin. No. Commissioner Alter. Yes. Commi uh, Vice Chair Busby. No. Chair Hyman. Yes. Commissioner Miller. Yes. And Commissioner Kanchin? Yes. Commissioner Santiago? No. Commissioner Baker? No. Commissioner Lowe? Commissioner Lowe? No. Okay, I got that. No. Got you. Commissioner MacGyver? No. The same, this one fails six to seven. Thank you. I have no other items listed. And I will, without any further business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'd make that, but I'm afraid it would fail. <laughs> Just say so moved. Move. Thank you, everybody. Same time tomorrow. See y'all then.